All right, so um, we're going to make a ballot box real quick with a couple of input elements. So, um, I don't know, kind of brainstorm with me. We need like an input for, I don't know, their name, first name, last name, and then we'll have like a couple radio buttons and then check boxes for like yes, no for propositions. Um, why don't we check out what other input elements we have? HTML, input, input types, input. Let's see. Those are attributes. Oh, that could work. So they could input any of these things. Here we have radio buttons, we have check boxes. So let's play around with it a little bit. So who's going to run America? Um, we'll put that in um, H3. Uh, and then we'll do the form tag, which will automatically create the action, but we don't really, um, we're not going to worry about that. Submit. With on submit, we could use JavaScript to handle it. So why do you need a form tag? Because at the very end, you want an input with the type of submit. And then you click that, and it will refresh the page like it just did right now. And so, yeah, that's going to be really annoying. So we have the input with the type of submit. We'll add input with the type of text. And then we'll make that um, the first name. So first name. Let's see how that looks a little bit bigger. Okay, it's kind of funky. So let's check out the optional label. Hmm. And if I want to go into this, no, oh, forget the label. So we have the first name, and then you enter that. We'll add a break, and then last name, input type of text, and then a break. Now there's certain other attributes that we could add to it. For instance, we could add a placeholder. Uh, first name. And there you see in gray that you see the, the placeholder. Placeholder equals last name. Now, when you're dealing with forms, really you should always have a, um, a name attribute. For example, if I click here or here, nothing like autofills really. But check this out. If I add a name attribute of first name, I click here. Is it first? Is it first name? Name? There we go. So it will automatically fill up based on what you've put in previously. I forget what the first name is and last name. So this I put name equals name as well. Oops, Gustav Anderson, my last name is music. All right, so that's the, um, the name attribute. Oops. All right, let's add in a a couple of radio buttons. So input type of radio. Um, who will? Oh, there we go. 
Who will you be voting for? So who will you be voting for? Hillary. Trump. And then we'll add a break there. Oh yeah, that's in the next lesson. Yeah. So right now it's not looking like radio buttons, right? Like, who knows why they're called radio buttons? Well, because in the older cars, when you'd push a radio button, the other one would pop out, so you could only press one at a time. And right now, for some reason, we could vote for both Hillary and Trump. So how do we get around that? Well, let's check out the HTML radio button. And here we go, we see again this name attribute that we saw before. So here we set the name equal to name. Last name? That's where I want to find what it is. So if we give a name to these radio buttons, for instance, name equal uh, candidate, name equals candidate, then if they both have the same name, then those two radio buttons are then linked together. All because we added the name attribute. Really, every form element should have its own name attribute. So up here, we have the name of name. So whatever name they are. Uh, let's add email just to show. So input type of email, and then uh, placeholder email, and then name equals uh, email. Check this out. If I click it then all my emails pop up. So it automatically fills up for you, all because of the name attribute. Fun stuff. So do that. Who will you be voting for? And let's just add a checkbox or two. So we'll add um, vote propositions or um, Was that? Oh, we have that. Like, oh, like, who do you think is gonna win? Uh, but that's still you can click multiple things. So maybe like, oh, check for yes. Leave empty for no. So here we have prop. I don't know. 99, and we'll do an input with a type of checkbox. So now you can check for yes or leave it empty for no. So boom, I would vote yes. Prop 199. Checkbox. Now what is it? 61, and I don't know what else is out. Right. So you could do that. So check boxes, vote yes for both, vote for either Trump or Hillary, right? You can't vote for both. Um, what else? Again, you have like color and all those other fun things. Ooh, another fun attribute is autofocus. So when you go onto a page, like say you go to google.com, where is your cursor? It's automatically in that search bar. So the way they do that is not by magic, it's with the auto focus, foxes, auto fox, auto focus, boom, and now, oh, finally saved, so let me open it up on the big screen, and let's see, my cursor is already in that first name box, so if I refresh it, notice my cursor is there, 
if I wanted to change that and make something else autofocus, like my email, then I could just put autofocus in the email. And there you go, the email is autofocused. This is just shorthand for autofocus equals true, by the way. But you really just have to write autofocus. So put that on first name. What else do we have? The name attribute placeholder. Ooh, required. So required is really fun because they're the things that are required. For instance, let's say you have to enter your first name and your last name, your email is optional, and then you have to either vote for Hillary or Trump. So how do we do that? Well, just like autofocus, we just add required. Required. And let's see what happens. Um, we'll also put a star after it, because uh, normally uh, let's add the small tag. Um, star indicates Required. So cool. Little small writing. The star indicates required. So the first name, last name. What happens if I hit submit? What? Please fill out this field. How awesome is that? Like, you don't have to program that. You don't have to check, hey, did they fill this in? No. So, like, alert some error message or whatever. It's given to you for free. So let's fill it up. Christopher. Oh, watch everything and hit submit hey please fill this out because we said that it's required uh, let's see if that works for radio buttons you do for both sign up so that's autofill submit please check one of these options okay we'll check Trump hey so there you go and then it automatically erases because it sends the data off to wherever it should. Questions? Pretty fun stuff, right? But for now, it's all just placeholders until we learn how to, um, how to actually use it. All right. No questions about any of this? validation and everything yeah we're gonna definitely get into that that's a lot of fun stuff yeah right how do we do that yeah so the only reason why they're not lining up is because um, the input boxes are inline elements so it's gonna go as far to the left as possible and because last name is shorter than first name that it's not going to be lined up so what you'd want to do really is you use like a grid format where you have all of the um like all of these things on the left side and then everything else on the right side so it lines up in like two column sort of thing and we could do that in the next example all right, so um, we'll do that right now. So the next lesson is box model. So what on earth is the box model? Well, if you remember, oh, this is terrible. Hold on, let me make this a little bit nicer. I don't like how the width is, we'll make it 80%. Fifty percent, and then we'll do margin, margin zero auto. Oops. Center it. There we go, and let's just. I don't want to center everything. We'll play with it. All right, so that already looks a lot better. So. The box model. What is it? What is it for? Well, I'll just show you a picture. CSS box model. And then we can play around with it. Images? So many options. 
All right, so here's their content, say like an input or a paragraph or whatever. You have padding on the top, bottom, left, and right. You have a border on the top, bottom, left, and right. And then you have a margin on the top, bottom, left, and right. Now, the border is kind of self-explanatory, right? If you want to put a border around something like this, like that, that makes sense, right? So next, let's learn what padding is good for. So think of padding as the padding on a wall in like an insane asylum. So what does it do? It pushes people away from the wall and toward the center, right? So if I use padding here, think of all this text as the crazy person and we want to put padding on the wall to push them in. So how do you do that? Well, you simply target um, whatever you want to have padding, which is our whatever has an idea of ballot. And I'm going to say padding 10 pixels. Now check this out. When I refresh the page, watch our crazy person go inward. So now it's not against the wall anymore. Okay. You could add more padding if you want, less padding, and so on. So that will push things inward. And now what we want to do is push things away. So let's say right here, this first name box is awfully close to this last name box. Now, padding wouldn't do anything to help that. You could add padding to the box itself, so when you type, the text isn't so close to the, the edge or the border. Why don't we do that? Why not? We'll add padding to every input element. So I'm going to target every, let's see, CSS, target input type. So what if I told you that there are more CSS selectors than just the element selector, the ID selector, and the class selector? There are a lot more, but really these are the most common, the element, the ID, and the class. But let's CSS selectors. The reference. All right, so here they all are. Quite a few, right? Don't worry. So we have the class selector, which selects all elements with the class of intro, right? Here's the example. And then the ID selector, select every element, or it selects the, it should be one element with the ID of first name. And then we have the, what's known as the universal selector which selects everything. It's similar to saying body. So, for instance, if instead of targeting the body and I did that, it's pretty much the exact same thing. Um, then we have the element selector, right, which um, is just the tag name. So P selects all P elements. And then if you want to select multiple elements, you just separate them with a comma. So if you want to select the div and all divs and all paragraphs, then you just add a comma. If you want to separate divs, paragraphs, or uh, change something in all divs, paragraphs, and like inputs, then you just add another comma. So you could add like as many of these as you want. Don't think that just because there are two, you can only have two. No, you could have. 22. Um, this we'll get into later on. I don't want to confuse you too much. But what we want is how to select just the, um, the inputs with the type of text. So I'll do that. So that's the tag and the type. Tag attribute value. Yeah. So this is what we're using right now. The attribute is type, and then the value is uh, text. So I'm going to say 
anything with the type yeah. equaling text we set the margin to temperatures. Hey, there you go. So what it does is it targets all of these inputs with the type of text and it says push everything away from me by 10 pixels. What is up with that space? Input with the type of text? No. So right now I'm noticing this big gap in between the first name and last name and not such a big gap in between email and last name. So let's inspect it and let's see what's going on. So, boom. So there we see that the border around it is how many pixels? Or the, the margin around it is 10 pixels, right? That's what we're expecting. And then around first name, the margin is 10 pixels, and the email, oh, type of email, that's why. OK, so that makes sense. Because the email has a type of email, so let's fix that. So input with the type of text, comma. We need to get rid of that, and then we'll do um, type equals email. There we go. So we're targeting anything with the type of text and anything with the type of email. So refresh, and there we go. Now we get that nice spacing that we wanted. Type is an attribute. Email is a value. Yeah. Exactly. Type of email. Mm -hmm. Now, the weird thing is that this doesn't show because it's offset. Is that margins overlap? What does that mean? Well, Let's say I have a div, I have two divs, now I'm going to target every div, um, height uh, 70 pixels, width of 70 pixels, background of uh, div. Hey, there we go. All right, sorry. Um, we'll do Dodger Blue. Okay, so um, we have two divs. Div one, div two, and let's add a margin. Margin of temperatures. Okay. So my question is, is the gap in between here 10 pixels or is it 20 pixels? Is it 20 pixels because each div has its own margin of 10 pixels? Or is it 10 pixels all together? Any guesses? What, what would you say? You would say 10 pixels? Dang it, you're not supposed to think about it like that. <laughs> Huh. What do you think? All right. So the gap in between there is actually 10 pixels. Why? Because think of it kind of like a contract. Like the margin just says, get anything 10 pixels away from me. Right? So div 1 says, nothing could be closer than 10 pixels to me. Div 2 says nothing could be closer than 10 pixels to me. So this gap 
is going to be 10 pixels. There is no minimum, not even zero. You could have negative margins. Yeah. So, so check it out. The gap is indeed 10 pixels. So what if I did a negative 10 pixel margin? Yeah, negative 100 pixel margin. Where did they go? Who knows? <laughs> but you can do it. So also you can do margin top, like 10 pixels, margin bottom, like 20 pixels, and so on. So you could customize it to however you want. So riddle me this. What's the distance between here? So we have only a margin top and a margin bottom. So let's start with div one. So the margin top is 50 pixels. OK, makes sense. And then the margin bottom is 20 pixels. OK. Then div two, the margin top is 50 pixels. So it has to be 50 pixels away. And then the bottom has 20 pixels. So in between here will be 50 because margins overlap. Yeah. So let's go to div 2, and there we have a 50 pixel margin. So that's the interesting thing. Um, I'm glad you guys are thinking about it and like calling out your answers, because even if you're not, um, even if you're not right, you're like that's when you learn. So, yeah, margins overlap. That's a key. I don't want you to like be freaking out later on um, and figuring out that they overlap on your own. When I can just help you. All right. So, that's not All right. So we got padding pushes stuff inward. Margin pushes stuff away. Very cool stuff. So let's add some padding. Man, that font is awesome. Let's add some padding to this to these inputs. So not only do we want the margin to be 10 pixels, we want the padding to be 5 pixels. So refresh it. Hey, the boxes got a little bigger, and now they're further away from the, um, from the borders. We could also change the border radius of them. Border radius 4 pixels. And then they'll all have rounded borders. There we go. Looking pretty cool. Digging it. Right. Anything else we want to maybe add a margin top to the submit button? So we could place type, uh, type of submit margin top. 20 pixels, and then that'll push the submit button down a little bit. Whoop. There we go. So fun stuff. Now we're like positioning stuff a little bit, just a little bit. All right, everyone understand the, the box model. It's pretty simple. It's really just padding, margin, and border. Um, but border is kind of like self-explanatory. So really, it's just um, margin and padding. Questions? Awesome. So let's get on to. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh huh. That is just for. Um, just because I was lazy and I didn't want to give each of them a class, I could have easily given them a, a class of um, 
I don't know, input. And then that way, instead of doing this, I could have just targeted the class of input. I just wanted to show you a new selector because there are multiple ways to select different elements on a page. It's not just the class, not just the ID or the element. You can have the multiple selector, the descendant selector, the parent selector. Like there, there are a lot of them. So this one would select all elements with a target attribute. For instance, um, anything that has an attribute of name. So we could target all of those. So name. Anything at all with an attribute of name, we can give it a, I don't know, background color of red. And there you see this, these three have the, um, the attribute name in them, which you see here, here, and here. But what we're doing here is we're checking for the attribute and the value. So we're checking that it has a type attribute of submit. For instance, right here we have the type attribute of submit. It's just a, a different selector. That's all it is. If you don't feel comfortable using these, just use classes. It's completely fine. It's very common to use classes anyway. Yeah. So really, I just want to show you that there there is more out there. Um, but you don't you don't have to memorize these at all. Does that kind of help? So this selects anything with a type attribute equal to submit. So I could even give like this H3 a type of submit. Hey, maybe not. Maybe because H3 shouldn't have a type. I don't think it likes that very much. I guess it only works if it makes sense. Which in that case it doesn't. All right. And then this will select selects anything with a name attribute. So if I give I think name might be global. If I just did that, um, let's put that on the H3. Let's try this. There we go. So I just gave it the attribute of name. I didn't set it equal to anything because it doesn't matter what it's set equal to. It's just checking if it exists. This one fuchsia. Fuchsia. Um, for Adam, Adam, I think there is. Yeah, I'm terrible at spelling. Adam, Adam will correct you like no other. Adam's nuts with it. Like it'll, like you type one letter, it's like, oh, did you mean this? Like, oh, calm down. But, like, it's really giddy. All right, if this wants to work. Come on. Yeah. 
right. But yeah, so in Atom, it will, like, you type in the letter B, and it's like, did you mean background? It's pretty cool. Good, that's a good problem to have. All right, so. Do I want to? No, let's talk about pseudo classes. They're way more fun. So, if you hover over something and you want it to do something, then you would use a pseudo class. So, what do we want to hover over and change? Maybe, like, you hover over Hillary and it turns red and then you hover over Trump and it turns like green or blue or whatever. So how would you do that? Well, just kind of um, like spitballing here. Well, I would need to target Hillary and then I would need to say like if you hover over the um, Hillary then you have to change the color to red and then you would target Trump and then you do the same thing, but a different color. So, step one was to target them. So how can I target them? Right now, they're just kind of free-floating. I literally cannot target them. There's no way that I could target Hillary and Trump as is. I would need to wrap them in something um, so that I could target them. So do I want like a div? Not really, because a div will, I just wrap Hillary in div, will put the, the dot on the next line. I, I don't want that. So is there something like a div, but more inline that doesn't have the, the line break? Yeah, of course. It's called span. So span is the exact same thing as a div, but the inline version of it, meaning there's no line break before and after, it doesn't stretch across the entire page, it's just as big as its contents. So span Hillary, and then I'm going to give her an ID of Hillary, and then same thing with Trump, I'll make a span, and give him an ID of Trump. Cool. So now I know what I want to target. So I target something with an idea of Hillary, something with an idea of Trump. So I will target ID Hillary, do something, and target Trump, and do another thing. So I said I wanted to target their font colors, which is not font color, which gets me all the time. It's just color. And then I'll say red. And Trump, color, blue. So refresh it. Hey, we got Hillary in red, Trump in blue. But that's not what we want. We wanted it to um, change color when you hover over them. Or maybe when you hover over them, it gets larger. Yeah, why not that? That'll be more fun because I kind of like the more colors. So when you hover over Hillary, we'll make the font size bigger. So how do you do that? Well, you target Hillary, add a colon, and you say hover. That's it. And then you just change whatever you want. So font size to 110%. So make it 10% bigger. And we'll do the same thing with Okay. We've done that. Or Trump hover. So now when you hover over either of them, you got a 10% increase in their font sizes. That's maybe not too noticeable. So I'll change it to 20. There we go. So Hillary Trump. Maybe Trump should get smaller. I don't know. So, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. So, 
Uh, let me comment that out. So now I'll just do Hillary colon hover, Trump colon hover, and now they're only going to change colors when you hover over them. Otherwise, what color are they going to be? The default black. So refresh. Now when you hover over Hillary, it's red and blue. You can change multiple things too. Like let's say um, you, when you hover over Hillary, the font size is going to be 120%. And hover over Trump, font size of 80%. So you can have a lot of fun with it. So, there we go. So Hillary gets bigger in red, Trump smaller in blue. Of course, it makes it a lot harder to click on them. Yeah, you can do that with anything. You can make this um, like go full width when they click on it or when their cursor is in it. Um, links are um, a very common thing to add um, selectors to. What about highlight? What if you change that? CSS change highlight. Okay. Yeah, I guess that's everything. Let's check that out. Hey, cool. So you can overwrite like everything. So that is just saying for everything, anything you highlight, change the background color to that. Which is fun. Um what was I gonna do? Oh yeah, links. So let's add a link to add it. Um Maybe like right below this, we'll have like an info area. So we see around America, the info, which is a link. So a h r um, click here for more info. So here we have this link. It's blue because we haven't visited it. I click it, and nothing happens because. It's not tied to anything. What if we tie it to something? We'll tie it to that. Right. So when I click down on it, it'll open this, go back, and it's still good. Um, well, you guys know that like if you've already visited a link it turns kind of purpley. Right? Like any thing in CSS, if you haven't noticed, the first thing is always purpley. Or like this is a little purple. I don't know if you can yeah, you can tell. Um, so those are already visited links. When you click down on it, it turns kind of bluish. That means that's when it's active. It's called active when you're clicking on it. It's called visited when you've already visited it. And then hover is just the typical hover. So let me explain further. Um, CSS hover. Here we go. So an unvisited link, you can target it by A and then the link. Kind of like, this is what I've done earlier, or what I did earlier, a tag colon hover. So here, don't worry about this, that's just fun. This, so my element colon hover, right? And then for mice, mouses, links, 
Um, if it's unvisited, you could change the color to green. If it's already visited, you change it to green. When they hover over it, it'll be red. And then um, active is when they're clicking down on it. So let's check it out. So I mouse over and click the link, so I hover it over it, it's red. If I hold, click and hold down, it's going to be yellow. So click, and there we have the yellow. So that's active. I let go, and there you go. So those are the four different things um, that links can have. So you wanted to change that on your page. Now, as a word of precaution, These have to be in a somewhat important order. I forget what the order is, to be honest. No one really remembers everything. So here, unvisited will make it um, fuchsia. Um, if it's visited, it's uh, lime green, hover will make it pink, and then when it's active, we'll keep it yellow. So, refresh. Now our link is green. When I hover over it, it's pink. When I click and hold down, it's yellow. And if we've already seen it, I don't think it will um, change colors just because of the JS bin thing. But you can also change the underlining, like if you don't want that underline, which is very common to remove. You don't see the underlining in a lot of things. So how do you do that? Well, CSS, remove underline from a tag, from a hover. <laughs> remove stubborn underline from link. Okay. Never read the question because they don't even know what they're doing. Um, so I see text decoration none. So we're only seeing that underline when we hover over it. So I'm going to go into my hover and I'm going to say when you hover over it, change the text decoration to none. So refresh it, hover, and there's no underline there anymore. Very powerful stuff. What else can you do with text decoration? Let's find out. Right, because this is a new property we just learned. We want to kind of look into it more to understand it. Oh, hey, look, you can do an overline. A line through, underline. Um, it's pretty much it for the most part. Yeah. So if you wanted an overline instead of an underline, you could do that. So we'll just put that somewhere. Um, when you hover over Hillary or Trump, because we made him small, we'll do text decoration overline. So hover over Trump, and we got that overline going. What do you mean? For which buttons? A link button? You mean just a link? Oh. Uh, 